body Hey friend, welcome to my channel Karina Lude where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars in history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so and turn your notifications on so you never miss an upload. Now let's get into this video. Today's episode is on Joyce Bryant. Many of you may not be too familiar with who she is, but she is one of these icons that you just have to know. You have to know who she is. She was an American singer, dancer, and civil rights activist. She rose to prominence in the late 1940s and early 1950s. She was known as the bronze blonde bombshell, the black Marilyn, the belter, and the voice you'll always remember for her iconic silver hair and figure hugging mermaid dresses which helped establish her as an early African-American sex symbol. But she did come with a lot of controversy which we are going to discuss that will probably shock you or maybe not <laughs> with the industry. I'm sure by now if you watch my videos you know Hollywood can get pretty weird down to the managers producers NPR so film historian and author Donald Bogle said of Bryant's provocative poses in a life magazine layout that they were the kind that readers rarely saw of white goddesses meaning they overly sensualized her which for the time I didn't really see that I didn't really see that as you see through these pictures I've done some for the white icons and they kind of still wore the similar dresses similar hairstyles did similar poses you know especially in the 1940s and 50s they were pretty sensual also right but this was in 1953 and it was still a very conservative culture and you guys may be shocked to believe that the black culture and black Hollywood was a lot more conservative than it was for white Hollywood where they were more angry or outraged whenever black women would be hyper sensualized in the media or in films they didn't really support women that did too much now it's like backwards right every hip-hop song or every song you see it's like <laughs> all over the place but back then it no it didn't used to be that way and people were very critical of that but Bryant was named as one of the five most beautiful black women in the world in an issue of Ebony the following year, alongside Lena Horne, Hilda Sims, Eartha Kitt, and Dorothy Dandridge. And I did videos for Lena Horne, Eartha Kitt, and Dorothy Dandridge, which I'll put in the end cards if you're interested, and I will be doing one on Hilda Sims very soon. All very gorgeous women. Bryant, at the height of her fame in 1955, quit the business to devote herself to the Seven-day Adventist Church. Many of you may not know that I myself am also a Seven-day Adventist, so it was very nice to hear this about her. She left the industry for 10 years to focus on her classical singing training before making her way back to the spotlight as a vocal coach. Dressing in eye-catching gowns that emphasized her hourglass figure, she was developing a signature sexiness. Many of Joyce's gowns are created so form-fitting that the singer cannot sit down in them, the Pittsburgh Courier wrote in 1954. Joyce had to develop a glide to move around. Radiator paint had been used to turn her hair a silvery color. Sometimes she would wear silver everything, including her hair, her dress, and her nails. She literally painted her hair with radiator silver color and stood out from everyone else. Before we get further into this video, let's get into her childhood so we can set the stage. Joyce Bryant had an interesting childhood growing up in Oakland, California with her seven siblings. Her father, Whitfield W. Bryant, worked as a chef for the Southern Pacific Railroad while her mother, Dorothy Constance Withers, was a devout Seventh-day Adventist. In such a strict home environment, Joyce was quite reserved and dreamed of one day becoming a sociology teacher. At just 14 years old, Joyce impulsively eloped, but the marriage didn't last long and ended that very same evening. In 1946, after visiting relatives in Los Angeles, she accepted a dare to sing at a local club only to be rewarded with an offer of $25, which was quite a bit of money during those days. 
The owner was so captivated by her voice, he offered her money to continue to sing at the club. This experience would lead to her breaking into the music industry and become what many refer to as the mother of rhythm and blues in the 1950s. From then on, Joyce continued to work hard towards fulfilling her dreams of becoming a teacher. She eventually got a break when Billie Holiday spotted her singing in 1950 and hired her as part of her show band. From there onwards, Joyce's career blossomed, leading to appearances at Carnegie Hall and other prominent venues until the mid-1950s when she shifted focus towards becoming an actress instead. Very quickly, she became known for her powerful contralto vocal range, which soon led to her performing at larger venues such as the Apollo Theater in New York. This also contributed to creating fan bases across Europe and Australia who are captivated by Joyce's raw and soulful sound. Her success also earned her interviews with magazines such such as Jet, where she spoke openly about how she broke into the music industry from such humble beginnings, all starting with that impromptu singing performance in LA. From a $400 weekly gig at New York City's La Martinique nightclub to a 118 show tour of the Catskill Mountain Hotel circuit, Bryant steadily built up a resume of regular work in the late 1940s. Her fame and notoriety grew to the point where she shared a bill with Josephine Baker one night. Bryant, fearing she would be overshadowed, painted her hair silver with radiator paint and performed in a skin-tight silver dress and a floor-length silver make. After entering the stage, Bryant said, I stopped everything, end quote. Bryant became one of the major headlining stars of the early 1950s, earning such monikers as the Bronze Blonde Bombshell, the Black Marilyn Monroe, the Belter, and the voice you'll always remember. As Etta James wrote in her autobiography, Rage to Survive, the Etta James story, published in 2003, she said, My intention was not to appear naive. Specifically, I aimed to resemble Joyce Bryant. The two of us hit it off. In awe of Joyce's boldness, I adopted her brash, self-reliant approach. End quote. Bryant began releasing albums for OK in 1952 with titles like A Shoulder to Weep On, After You've Gone, and Farewell to Love. Among others, the radio stations refused to play Love for Sale and Drunk with Love, two of her most well-known standards, because of their sensually explicit lyrics. Two years later, when Running Wild was released, Jet pointed out that it was Bryant's first to be passed by CBS and NBC radio censors, who blocked three earlier songs for being too sexual. During an interview in 1980, Bryant said, Love for Sale was my most successful album, which is hilariously ironic. It was initially banned in Boston and eventually everywhere else. Bryant opposed Jim Crow laws and criticized the entertainment industry for its racial billing practices. Despite the threat of the Ku Klux Klan, who had burned an effigy of her, Bryant became the first black entertainer to perform at a Miami Beach hotel in 1952. When she performed at the Casino Royale in Washington, D.C. in 1954, she was one of the first black singers to do so. Despite what she had heard about the club's segregation policies, she was surprised to find that it was packed with African-American patrons. She remarked, and I quote, I was thrilled to see them walk in and be greeted so warmly by the management, end quote. And let's get into why she left the industry. Bryant earned up to $3,500 a performance in the early 1950s, but she had grown weary of the industry. The industry was making her really sad and really depressed. The silver paint that she used on her hair started to damage her hair. She did not enjoy also working on the Sabbath and she felt uneasy with her image. She said, religion has always been a part of me and it was a very sinful thing I was doing, being very sexy with tight low cut gowns. She also recalled, I had a very bad throat and I was doing eight performances a day. A doctor was brought in to help and he said, I can spray your throat with coke and that will fix the problem, but you'll become addicted. Then I overheard my manager say, I don't care what you do, just make that B word sing. Ooh, do you see how much they don't care? Shaka Khan tried to tell y'all I did a video for Shaka Khan also check it out. And she continued saying, I said to myself, if a human being can be exploited this way, she said, if somebody who is supposed to be guiding your career can be so selfish and greedy, even willing to risk you becoming hooked on narcotics for the sake of the almighty dollar, then I'd better get out, end quote. 
1950, she made $200,000 a year, which would be worth about $2.5 million in today's money. Bryant was always on the move, so she would change from her formal attire to more casual fare like a sweater and pants, and from her high heels fit for a queen to more practical loafers. Her fatigue was obvious, and her self-trained voice was cracking under the pressure. Furthermore, Bryant hated the men, often gangsters, who frequented the clubs in which she worked. She was once beaten in her dressing room after rejecting a man's advances. Her disenchantment with the substances and the gangster subcultures, combined with pressures from her management, led Bryant to quit performing late in 1955. Bryant joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church and started attending classes at Oakwood University in Huntsville, Alabama. An article titled The New World of Joyce Bryant, former cafe singer, gives up $200,000 a year career to learn to save God appeared in the May 1956 issue of Ebony. As Bryant spent years exploring the South, she became increasingly frustrated by the sight of hospitals turning away black patients in desperate need of treatment. Since then, she has continued to perform at benefit concerts for her church, where she raised money by singing and playing the piano in her natural black hair without any makeup to draw attention to the cause. The 1960s saw Bryant's return to the entertainment industry where she studied voice under Frederick Wilkerson at Howard University and ultimately landed a contract with the New York City Opera. With the Italian, French, and Vienna opera companies, she performed all over the world. In the 1980s, she resumed her career as a jazz singer and vocal coach, counting Jennifer Holliday, Phyllis Hyman, which I did a breakdown for Phyllis Hyman if you guys are interested. She was just so gorgeous to me. And Raquel Welsh at also also did a breakdown for her also phenomenal woman may she rest in peace they were amongst her students who took vocal lessons from her now as far as her death late on the 20th of november at the age of 95 the singer and pioneer in the fields of beauty and fashion passed away robin labode her niece cared for her for the last 10 years of her life as she declined rapidly from the effects of diabetes and alzheimer's and I could not find if she ever remarried again. I searched high and low, guys. I could not find any information if she, since her elopement, any type of relationship, children, or anything like that. So she lived a pretty quiet and reserved life. And may she never be forgotten. She did a lot of work, a lot of activism in the industry. And she was one of those first people that left and walked away from the industry and was vocal about why. You know, and during those days, it was not too popular to speak about why you walk away. They weren't as bold, but she went through a lot. And it was a dark era for Hollywood. We see a lot of these glamorous women. I did a breakdown for Lucille Ball also and Lucille Ball from I Love Lucy used to be surrounded by these gangsters too to the point where she was dating one and they all was in these nightclubs that they would perform at and stuff so it was that kind of life for these women and they would come and look prim and proper and very sophisticated and elegant but this is what they were dealing with and sometimes it would get very risky and very dangerous and managers today in Hollywood still do this where they will pump up their artists with substances to have them continue to perform and almost have them in a trance to be a slave. I'm glad that Joyce Bryant walked away from that because we've seen that happen to many artists today that always seem to pass away from taking too much substances. It's just very, very sad. And if you just decide to walk away, sometimes they'll just end your life. <laughs> like Michael Jackson allegedly said they did, they would do to him, right? I always applaud any woman who walks away and was able to maintain their lives and was able to maintain a happy ending. So if you like the music you're listening to, the link is in the description. I love you guys so much. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time.